This session is an interview with Gerald Thomas Yaxley, who fought with the 104th Infantry Division in Europe. This interview is for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Today is September 11th, 2007, and we are in the WILL uh, studio here on the University of Illinois campus in Urbana, Illinois. My name is Harriet Williamson. Also in the studio is Henry Radcliffe, who is the sound, light, and recording engineer for this session. Thank you very much for being with us today. It's my uh, honor. Well, it's sir, I'm it's alive, our honor. and <laughs> like to share anything that I can share with my fellow human beings. So I'm just happy I'm alive and here. We're very happy you're alive and here with us today. Right. Um, could you tell us where you were born, your background, and uh, where you went to school and um, a little bit maybe about your family and how you came to enter the military. How I what? Came to enter the military. Oh, okay. Okay, I was born in Ridgeway, New York, which is halfway between uh, Rochester and Buffalo, New York. I was born in the country in a two-story home and I was born like they were 84 years ago, born in the living room. And the doctor had his little satchel and came and delivered me. My mother uh, did most of the work naturally. Um, so I was born on December 5th, 1923. Um, lived there about uh, say about five years. Then my dad, Leo, uh, he worked in a factory um, making tools, but he didn't like, like inside work. He was a country boy, so he bought a farm, a fruit farm, over on the county line road in um, Orleans, Orleans County. That's why they call it the county line road, because Orleans County was on the east side and Niagara County was on the west side. Okay, um, we moved there about 19, oh, 1929, 1930. And my dad was the um, trustee of a one-room rural school, Heartland number nine. And actually, you know who became the custodian this man, this boy. <laughs> and every morning I had to get up at 6.30 or 7 o'clock and go over uh, to the rural school. And we had a, a big chunk stove, huge. And I had to um, get the ashes out of the grates and, and build a fire and um, uh, make sure the school room was inhabitable uh, by the time uh, we, must, we must have had about 25 kids came to that rural school. So I went there uh, at Hartland number nine rural school for two years and my dad who was quite an activist and believed in education um, worked with several people in the community and um, Got, had the um, people uh, centralize uh, their schools. And that meant uh, here in the Midwest, we call it consolidation of schools, but in the New York State, they call it centralization. So uh, about two years later, when I was in about fourth grade, I think, I went to uh, Barker Central School. Uh, where I graduated in 1941. Well, um, the war hadn't got started yet, but um, I took what they call a PG course, postgraduate course. And in that postgraduate course, it was um, learn how to rivet uh, on aluminum fat, uh, uh, fabric, aluminum fat airplanes. 
because I, I lived near Buffalo, and that's where they made the P-41. So I learned how to do that, but my dad worked at a uh, uh, factory about eight or nine miles away at Middleport, New York, so he knew a lot of people there, and he knew the, uh, uh, the head person of the um, chemistry department because they, they made all insecticides, lead arsenate, chemical, uh, calcium arsenate, uh, lime and sulfur, all hundreds of different insecticides. So, and I'd had uh, uh, chemistry in high school, so he asked me if I'd like to go in and have an interview with this uh, Mr. Towers. Mr. Towers, he was the uh, boss. So I went in and got the job with Mr. Towers. And I, uh, the only bad thing about the job was that uh, it was shift work. Uh, had three different shifts, eight, eight, eight to four, and four to 12, and 12 to eight. Well, really, and it, it's good because if you're on that, uh, Let's see, if you're on the uh, afternoon shift, 4 to 12, well, you can have no dates, and you don't go shopping, <laughs> so you don't spend any money. So it's, it's really a godsend to, to work shift work sometimes. Okay, then, let's see, that brings us up to about um, 1941, I guess. Yeah. Um, so I worked there uh, till 42. And then my mother, who was wanted me to get more education, said, Jerry, or she used to call me uh, Gerald, uh, you better get an education. So I applied at Penn State and got accepted at Penn State. And I went to Penn State one semester, and then I got that draft notice. Right, you showed that to us, and it's being scanned. Yeah, mm -hmm. I got that draft notice saying, Uncle Sam, we want you. <laughs> <laughs> now, were you expecting that draft notice? Oh, yes, yes, because mm -hmm. some of my friends in the North Ridgeway, uh, that's where we moved to, my dad bought this fruit farm. Um, some of them had received uh, mm -hmm. their um, notification of mm -hmm. to uh, be present and go have a physical. Mm -hmm. So that happened on February 16th, 1943. Well, my buddy Truman Johnson, whose dad ran the uh, garage in uh, he and I went and took our physical at LB in New York, and we passed. So they gave us seven days to get everything cleared up and shaped up before you went in the service. So on February 23rd, I was uh, we went to um, from Madonna, New York. We went from there up to uh, Fort Niagara, which had become a uh, induct induction. Uh, base for oh, all, well not all, but many Western New York uh, men. I didn't see any ladies, but mm -hmm. I think they were all men at that time. Um, so I was up there, oh gosh, got my clothes and shoes and necessities for the Army, and then I went, we, uh, or I got on the, uh, on a troop train, and four days and four nights, we rode from uh, Niagara Falls out to the southwest to uh, well, it's Huma, Arizona, Y-U-M-A, or Indio, California, to the Mojave Desert. And um, uh, I, I got accepted there by the uh, Fourth Mechanized Cavalry. Regiment, there's a regiment. Regiment's about 1,700, 1,800 soldiers. 
So I took my basic training from, um, I think we got out there in the Mojave Desert probably around the um, 27th, 28th of February of uh, 43. And took eight weeks of basic training. Basic training means where you learn how to shoot a rifle, a pistol, a submachine gun. Um, um, many of the weapons of the army. That's basic training. And naturally, you marched every day and uh, you did calisthenics and all those good things that soldiers do. So then, I, um, that was at Camp Young, I believe. Uh, the regiment moved from there farther north up the uh, Mojave Desert to uh, Camp Coxcomb, um, which I think, and I'm not positive about this, but I think uh, Old Blood and Guts General Patton founded that uh, uh, armored, it was an armored base for tanks, mostly tanks, because that's what he was known for, tanks, uh, to train before they went to Africa. So um, I was there still with the uh, fourth mechanized cavalry reconnaissance uh, regiment until for about four weeks. And I uh, took basic training in the medical detachment to be a, uh, be a medic or a first aid person which I did, and uh, I learned a lot, but I didn't, didn't uh, pan out to be a medic. I, uh, somebody must have looked through my cumulative folder, or my folder, and seen that I'd um, gone to college. I had a half year, approximately a half year of college at Penn State. So if you look back through the history of um, our country, uh, in 1941 to, well, 19, after Pearl Harbor, after 1941, why, um, universities had lost a lot of their male population, and they were hurting. I mean, it was mostly women going to universities and colleges back in those days, and universities and colleges were hurting. For, to, uh, to hold their staff, their faculty, and uh, so the government, our government decided that uh, we should send uh, young, young uh, armed or um, soldiers or Navy, the Navy too, not just the Army. When Army, I was in the, what they call the Army ASTP. Army Specialized Training Program. And they, uh, they had, there was about four different branches that there was a medical corps where they were sending some young guys back who had started medical school before the war and they were gonna, because we need doctors naturally during the war. So they sent them to all different colleges, Hunter, uh, Hunter School, University, oh, all, the, all the Big Ten schools and Princeton and all the Ivory League schools, Cornell, because uh, they needed money from Uncle Sam to keep their faculty and keep their uh, institutions running. Mm -hmm. So um, I came out here in June of 1944, I believe it was, and um, The course of study was very, very, to me at least, uh, very, very uh, concentrated. Um, they just, I didn't have the aptitude really of being an engineer. I, I'm just not that intelligent, I guess. But, um, so I lasted about 24 weeks and they decided that uh, I wasn't too good of an investment uh, to 
the educated to go over and uh, rebuild Germany or rebuild uh, European countries that our bombers had blown to bits. So I, um, I was shipped back out to um, Mojave Desert, where I started from with the 4th Mechanized Cavalry, up Hume, Arizona, same place. So I joined up there with the 104th, 104th. This is the 104th uh, uh, insignia for the 104th Timberwolf Division, which is an infantry division, 104th. And our, um, our general, he, he had just joined the 104th, I think it was in 42, because uh, he was in Africa. Terry Allen, his name was Terry Allen. He flunked out of West Point, but uh, because of some of the academic subjects, he, he couldn't grasp. But the strategies and the military part, he excelled. And thank God that they, um, or thank somebody, uh, they decided that uh, he should be a general. And by gosh, he was. And um, he took over the 104th Infantry Division, and uh, I think it was um, 42, I'm not positive that, up at Camp Adair in uh, Oregon, the state of Oregon, I believe it was, yeah. And um, well, I guess I'm confusing myself here. Um, after I closed up at University of Illinois. I got my 20, 24 weeks in and they didn't want me anymore. Uh, they sent me out there at uh, Hume, Arizona. How, how, much, how much longer were you in training then in Arizona? Was it considered basic as well? Yeah, I gave us basic right uh -huh. over again. Well, it was infantry. In infantry. Infantry is different than cavalry. So what we didn't have horses, but they had light tanks okay. and cavalry did. So and what I, kind of training then would you have in the infantry? Uh, bayonet. Mm -hmm. The bayonet. Um, oh, uh, hand grenade. You don't throw a hand grenade like a baseball. You, you lob it. You lob it over. You don't throw it like a baseball. You lob it. And they say that they give us um, training and um, grenade throwing, um, bayonet, out of bayonet another human being. Uh, they, um, oh, uh, how to shoot the rifle. Mm -hmm. And I, I was a country boy and I had a rifle when I was real young and I learned and I was in a rifle club so I, uh, I was pretty good. Uh, the rifle you were trained on was what was that, and did you carry that into combat? Then? Yes, I did. Was it the same one that you were trained with? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Was Don't let me forget. There's something real interested uh, about that rifle. Okay. Don't let me forget to tell okay. you about that if we have time. Certainly, we have plenty um, of time. Where were we? Uh, training in Yuma. Okay, I joined the 104th Infantry Division because they were coming off maneuvers. Mm -hmm. They were getting, coming off maneuvers. So um, we moved from, uh, um, I don't know what that camp was now. I don't know if it was Camp Coxcomb or what it was, but we moved from that uh, Huma, Arizona, or uh, uh, Mojave Desert, Arizona. We moved to, um, Camp Carson, Colorado. That's near um, oh, Pikes Peak. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where the uh, uh, 10th Mountain Division uh, trained too. They they were skiers. They uh, they were skiers because there was a lot of mountains around uh, 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 Camp Carson. Mm -hmm. And if you've been around Colorado, you know mm -hmm. uh, there's a, that's a, a wonderful winter resort out in that area. So uh, the 10th Mountain Division, uh, 
my wife's cousin. He was uh, he was in the mount the tenth mountain division because see they ended up in Italy because mm -hmm. Italy had a lot of mountains and he got killed in Italy. Yeah. He was in the infantry tenth mountain division. Mm -hmm. Um. Now where am I? Well, did when you were in Colorado then at Fort Carson, how, how much longer was your training and did that did that um, continue with the artillery type of training that you had mentioned? No, it wasn't artillery. If I can said artillery, I misspoke because um, that was infantry rifle. I'm infantry. sorry, you you said infantry. I, yes, that's uh -huh. okay. Uh -huh. We're human beings; we do make mistakes. Just if we misinterpret, question that person. That's why mm -hmm. I always believe and make sure I don't know. Just say I'm hard of hearing. I didn't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I can't remember how long we were in um, Camp Carson, but several weeks. Mm -hmm. And then uh, well, we got the day off on D-Day, June 6th. Mm. They, they took us into a camp and we were in barracks then and we listened to D-Day. Mm -hmm. But um, how, what did, what were they doing that you could listen to it? Were you listening to the actual battle or no? Just a commentary. Commentary. Some you know somebody's uh -huh. telling. So it was their, like a news report. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. yeah. But now, I don't what know. what did you think of your training in terms of of uh, whether it prepared you and and what was it like? Well. Um, I was probably, let's see, I went in the service when I was um, 19, I think. And I was a pretty rugged individual because I'd mm -hmm. played uh, quite a few sports and I'd lived on a farm and mm -hmm. pitched hay and manure and everything, so I was in pretty good shape. Well, they trained us, well, how to crawl with a rifle cross arm how to cross, keep your head down, keep your butt down, and stay as low as you can. Um, no, well, no smoking when you're in combat, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'll tell you later what that did to me, I think. <laughs> um, okay, now where are we? I'm lost again. Now, it's my understanding that General Al Allen is that Allen, A L L E N. That, he was, Allen. that his tactic when he took you to Europe was night raids. Pardon me? Was night raids? Yes, he so, was a night fighter. Right, night fighter. So, night so fighter. while you were in with him, yes. did did they do training at night to prepare you for that kind of combat? Not that I know of. Okay. We had it back here in the States at Camp Carson. Mm -hmm. uh, we had maneuvers where we were we would fight at night. Mm -hmm. uh, when you fight at night, you don't put a clip of, sh of bullets or shells in your in your rifle. You just have the bayonet, cold mm -hmm. steel. And if you think about it, uh, cold steel is pretty pretty uh, terrifying. Yes, mm -hmm. just like back in the Civil War when they used to fight around the cavalry with. A, their swords and mm -hmm. steel is psychologically and scare the heck out of anybody. Mm -hmm. Well, um, did you know while you were in Colorado that you were going to go to Europe versus going to Asia? No, 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 mm -hmm. no. Well, we left. Um, I think we were in Colorado about four months, five months, six months. I don't know, several months. Mm -hmm. And then we we went to um, Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. That was a staging area for infantry to go overseas. Mm -hmm. So uh, we stayed there two or three days mm -hmm. till they got us inoculations, mm -hmm. shots, got us ready to go overseas. So. Um, um, we took, uh, well, they took us by train to uh, a ferry uh, in New York City, 
uh, Hudson River. Mm -hmm. And then they uh, put us on these ferries and then took, took us out to our, uh, or over to our um, ship. Uh, and our sh my ship was the, uh, let me see, I think it's USS George Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, and it held about 5,000. Mm -hmm. Well, they put 5,000 <laughs> in it. It shouldn't have held, <laughs> held that many, but <laughs> they put 5,000 because we were, we were stacked on hammocks four deep. Oh, that sounds really uncomfortable. Yes, and uh, <laughs> thank God, <laughs> and thanks humbly, um, I was on the top. <laughs> and everybody had their steel helmet. And, um, well, probably three out of every four got seasick. Mm -hmm. So if you're down below, <laughs> you, you might get vomited on. <laughs> but I was up on the top. Yeah. And I was lucky. I didn't, uh, I didn't get sick. I had a good stomach. So I uh, used to, um, I used to be able to go up out of the hole. You know what I mean by the hole. Mm -hmm. That's where you live. Mm -hmm. Well, holes where you put cargo too, but hole in this case is human beings. <laughs> so uh, th I, I would get out of the hole three times a day. I could eat. I could eat breakfast, mm -hmm. uh, dinner or lunch, and then supper. I could eat three times a day because I had a good stomach. And mm -hmm. well, then my job was used to. Um, mop or swab, they used to call it, swab the deck fore and aft. And uh, if, if you didn't get sick, uh, you could do this. And there was quite a few of us that we got that responsibility. At least it was good we got out of that hole because it, it, it didn't have a very good odor or, or <laughs> scent or whatever you want to call it. There could be any people throwing up down in there. So, um, so it took us from... Um, I think it was August 26th until September 7th, 1944. We landed in Cherbourg, France. Mm -hmm. That's that peninsula that sticks up uh, off on the north north uh, west part of France. Um, uh, so we stayed there. About a month. Mm -hmm. Well, the Germans uh, were still out on Guernsey Island and Jersey Island. They, they bypassed them. But they used to sneak in nights because we had a line, gas line, oil line, going from um, Cherbourg to Paris to feed the tanks and the trucks and all the vehicles that needed gas mm -hmm. and oil. So they'd sneak in and cut our lines, so we did. Some of us, we'd have to, we, we'd be uh, spaced every so often down um, by the uh, ocean there. So if, if the Germans came in off of Jersey or Guernsey Island, mm -hmm. you know, we, we either captured them or killed them, mm -hmm. one or the other. Okay, so then after staying in Cherbourg or Brittany, I believe, for about, let me see, that would be, um, that would be um, September 7th, yeah, September 7th, till about October 20th, uh, we stayed there in, in France, or near Sherbrooke. So then they, um, At that time, the um, Germans had invented the uh, buzz bomber V2. That's the one uh, they launched it around uh, Antwerp, Holland, and they la launched it over to London because it, it was it was supposed to be a um, well, what do you call things that harass people or make them feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. See, they, they, they send those V-bombs mm -hmm. over towards London. Well, uh, 
we Americans and the British, we didn't like that. So we, 104th Infantry Division, we went up in Holland. Well, we, we fought in Belgium, I think, two days, and then we went into Holland and um, fought with the British and the Canadians. Uh, Montgomery was the head of the uh, British and the Canadians. So we fought with them for about two weeks and uh, took over quite a bit of land. The British, and uh, I'm English myself, I shouldn't put them down, but I'm going to tell the truth. Um, the British, or English, they had tanks up in there and they would um, just about every afternoon at 3 o'clock, they'd have their tea. They'd stop, <laughs> and uh, they had the water next to the exhaust, big big exhaust, and that would heat their water so they had hot tea. And uh, <laughs> and we'd be marching by them sometimes, and they'd say, um, hey, you bloody bloke, would you like to have some tea? <laughs> well, I don't have time. Thanks a lot, Limey. <laughs> but they were good people. I mean, the British and the English were better than the Americans, I think, because they would not take a town unless they'd blown it to pieces. Where we Americans, uh, we sent the troops in and, well, the artillery usually went first, try to blow them up, blow the city up or village or hamlet, whatever it might be. And then, but um, the British, oh, did a much better job of destroying their um, their problem or their village or city to protect their their um, buddies, their soldiers. Mm -hmm. Where Americans, uh, uh we were gun fodder lots of times. Um, Why do you think there was that difference? I do not know. Mm -hmm. I think Americans are more aggressive. I can't prove that. <laughs> but I think we Americans are very aggressive people and we're impatient. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't prove that, but that's my own feeling. Okay. I could be right and I could be wrong. But um, so we fought with the British and the English, the British and the Canadians, for about a couple of weeks from uh, about October. I think our first day in battle was in Belgium, October 25th. Now was that the first combat that you were in? Yes. Mm -hmm. And we lost uh, a company now. I was in a company I. A company is made up of four platoons. And a platoon, I mean a, a company is made up of three rifle uh, platoons and one what they call a heavy weapons platoon. Heavy weapons is machine guns and mortars. Mm -hmm. They're considered heavy weapons. And each platoon probably, well there's 12 men to a squad and there's three squads to a um, platoon so that'd be about 36 men. 36 men to a um, to a platoon. Mm -hmm. Besides then you have your tech sergeant, he's your one of your leaders, but he's with the first lieutenant or second lieutenant who is the leader mm -hmm. or who is the organizer or who tells you which way to go, what to do. So, um, yeah, we lost uh, about three or four a day, the 25th, 26th of, uh, of uh, October. And then, um, we took quite a few uh, Flemish, Holland, villages and town and liberated them and very, very happy people, very appreciative of American people, American soldiers uh, coming into their country to liberate them. I went over in 1994, 50 years after the D-Day mm -hmm. and with a group of my buddies and they just opened up their doors and treated us like kids.
kings and queens. They're just so thankful that we liberated their their small villages, and they appreciated it very, very much. No doubt, they uh, they lost people too. I mean, you know, who was that? No, well, that's not it. Um, they had resistance. They had people that you know that helped us because they knew where the Germans were and were located, and they would, would tell our our sergeants, our lieutenants, or where where they were and where the artillery is. So we would be protected somewhat, not much, but some. Was that fighting house to house kind of fighting? Uh, yes, we did. Not much, mm -hmm. but not much. I didn't get in much house to house. Mm -hmm. That's the roughest fighting there is. Uh, because you don't know who's in the back of that door. Mm -hmm. And you don't take any chances. You shoot first and ask second. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, lots of times I think in our war, we blame the, the GI, the soldier, for killing innocent people. Mm -hmm. And no doubt he does. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying he doesn't. Mm -hmm. But you, you never know. Mm -hmm. You don't know. Mm -hmm. If somebody's in the back of that door, mm -hmm. give it the bayonet or shoot. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you tell them, come on out, come on out. But if nobody comes out, well, what are you going to do? Before you go in, you, mm -hmm. you're trained to protect yourself first. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one of the models of uh, being in the infantry. They always tell us, better to save yourself so you can fight another day. Mm -hmm. Don't do not do crazy things so you get yourself killed. Was wounded. there was there a motto for your division? Yes, 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 yes. Nothing, nothing in hell can stop the Timberwolves. <laughs> nothing in hell can stop the Timberwolves. That's, that, that was our model. I didn't hear it say. I didn't hear it said very much, but mm -hmm. that was our model. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now we're we're um, up in Holland. Yeah. Okay. We stayed up there till about uh, November. Yeah, about November six or seven. We had comp we had accomplished our uh, our mission. That uh, Montgomery. Th and asked us to come up to help fight with, with the British and the Canadians. So, mm -hmm. so then we were asked to come back down. I can't think. I think it was the Ninth Army under General Collins. Can't think. Yeah, General Collins, I think. So we left Holland, and we came. Uh, we rode. Uh, six by six trucks, um, six by six, um, we held about probably 20 men, something like that. So we took, had a convoy and took our division mm -hmm. back down and we went back down to um, Aachen, A-A-C-H-E-N, Aachen, um, Germany. And the uh, first division had um, had taken over uh, Aachen about a week or two before before we got there. So we relieved the, the first division was still there, but we got in their foxholes and they, they I don't know where they did send them, but they they took them and sent them a different place and mm -hmm. put us in because we were considered a green a green. Uh, un, what's another word? If you're green, you're untried, maybe. Yeah, you're not mm -hmm. trained, or you're not ready. You're mm -hmm. not accustomed mm -hmm. to combat, which is well training. Mm -hmm. So um, we um, we stayed there, Aachen, and that was that was that was like let's say the um, east side of that village or city and about uh, probably about a quarter of a mile or half a mile from made from here to the Union building uh, was a Siegfried line. Mm. Siegfried line. Mm -hmm. And um, 
it's quite a it's quite a architecture, quite a building spree where they put all these um, um, they put all these um, look like pyramids, but they cut the top off the pyramids. Well, they're really for um, anti-tank. Mm -hmm. The tank they, and they stagger them so the tank can't get through without losing its tracks. Mm -hmm. So. Um, um, Zig yeah, well, they had the, they had the dragon's teeth, they call them, and then they had pillboxes. The pillboxes was a um, just a big room, but only maybe uh, a sixteenth of it is above the ground. The rest of it's down in the earth with cots where they slept, the Germans, and the top part, the uh, uh, fox, uh, pillbox it had slits in it every so often up on top mm -hmm. where they could they could see anybody coming towards it they had a field of vision where they could see uh, soldiers or their enemy coming towards them and then they had uh, machine guns and 20 20 millimeter guns and I don't know what else um, but um, excuse me uh, we had um, a first platoon under Lieutenant, I um, can't think of his name, Barton. Yeah, Lieutenant Barton. Uh, they were trained specifically how to take pillboxes. And um, they uh, they went up one evening, well, about sun, the, about dusk time, not totally dark and not totally light. And he took up his platoon, which was probably not 36 anymore because he's been wounded, probably about 25. So they... Um, Excuse me. They went up to the Siegfried line there, and uh, they had their Bangalores, which was a, a charge of dynamite on the end of a pole, so they could stick it in that slot and then set it off and blow up part of the pillbox. Well, we had a we had a young fella named Joel Schmolzenhauser, I think. He's a German. He wasn't he wasn't an American citizen. Believe it or not, he was not an American citizen yet. But he was fighting in the American army. And he could speak fluent German. So um, he asked our captain, Captain Johnson, because he knew there was going to be massacre or a lot of our soldiers get killed with these pillboxes. So he asked uh, our captain if he could take a, a German officer, prisoner, a German prisoner of war, and um, his lieutenant, uh, I can't think of his first name, Brent. No, that was the last one. I don't know. I can't remember. So they, they went up about dusk and um, They got to talk to, uh, I don't know how they maneuvered around, but they did. Uh, they went to one pillbox and they let them inside. I think they had a white flag. I don't know, something. But they got in to talk to the soldiers and the officer in charge of that pillbox. So he, he talked to them and he persuaded them that the odds were so much against them that they, they wouldn't live and they'd be much happier and safer if they were to give up and come back to the American lines and be POWs. Hmm. So he, 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 well, the, um, the soldiers wanted to give up because they'd been fighting, you know, I don't know, don't know about a long time. Mm -hmm. And they were fatigued and mm -hmm. cold and everything else. But their officer would not, officer would, the German officer would not give up. So 
they went to another pillbox farther on down and talked to that um, group of German soldiers, about 20 of them, I guess, and the officer, and the same thing happened to him. He wouldn't give up the pillbox. So they went on down to um, another pillbox, and that was a higher officer. He's a captain. Uh, I think maybe SS men, because the higher you go in the German army, you get the more radical or the more uh, meaner, tougher, uh, less less humanity. Uh, 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 just mean. Just, you know, don't, life is nothing to them. So he said no, kapuk or some German word that means no. So he came back through and he stopped and at these other two pillboxes and they, uh, the officer finally said, yes, we'll give up. So he, in the, the prisoner, German prisoner of war and uh, his, his officer, Brent, uh, started coming back to the American lines. And they got about 50 yards back, and pretty soon they look around. There was 40 Germans, about 40, oh I don't know, for sure. But that's what they wrote down in the book, about 40, uh, about 40, um, 40 Germans. So we, um, they brought them back. They came back without, without killing anybody. Mm. So he got the, uh, I forget what that's called, the highest, Distinguished Service Award or some uh, a medal mm -hmm. for uh, getting these German soldiers to uh, give up and mm -hmm. uh, withdraw their fighting mm -hmm. and come back to American lines and be POWs. So he's still alive. Mm -hmm. uh, he lives in Chicago. Joe, he's a wonderful guy. Um, okay, that's, uh, so this is around November 16th, I think, in that area. So that's, that's the time when we had several divisions, the 1st, and I can't think, the 4th, the 9th, the 3rd Armor, well, there's three or four more divisions. They were going to make a, a big attack. So we did have a big attack. 2,400 of our bombers and British bombers came over and bombed straight for 20 miles so we could soften them up so we could. On that line? Yeah, on that mm -hmm. line, uh, on the Siegfried line, so we could get through and uh, keep going into uh, Germany. Uh, so. Um, So that was around November, 16th, 17th. Well, we went, we went probably 15 miles or 20 miles in that neighborhood, uh, east of the Siegfried Line. Mm -hmm. And we were taking small villages. Um, we had stayed at, um, Frankenhofen was a German village. And the next morning we were going to take Putz home. P-U-T-Z-H-O-L-M, I believe. Putz home. It was a small village. And, and um, intelligence, G2, uh, told our lieutenant, Lieutenant Sullivan, uh, that there weren't very many uh, German soldiers in that village, that it should be very easy to take. Well, look out. Don't believe G2 or intelligence because they're, they're only human beings and they do make mistakes. Well, they did make a hell of a mistake on us because we started going across that morning. We started going across this uh, open sugar beet, sugar beet field and we got about two-thirds way across it and they opened up on us. Mm. And... That's, uh, we lost, oh gosh, 
probably eight, ten, eight or ten um, killed. I got wounded, and uh, a couple of my buddies got prisoner of war, mm. uh, uh, prisoners, so uh, they took them back. Um, now I'll tell you about uh, how I got wounded. Mm -hmm. um, It was uh, probably about, uh, well, we went across this open field, and as I said, uh, they let us, they sucked us in, mm. uh, where we were up a third, uh, two thirds of the way across. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, I saw my buddy, they opened up on him with a machine gun. Mm. Spun him around three or four times and went down probably 30 feet away from me and I hollered at him. His name was Bob Stinger. I hollered, Bob, Bob. No answer. Mm. You know, I, said, I, I said, I know better save yourself. So I just passed an artillery hole. Now an artillery hole, artillery, they shoot a shell that goes down in the ground and then it explodes and it makes a cone shape in the dirt. It makes a cone. I don't, I don't know why. I don't know enough about um, ballistics or power, how it works, but physicists would know that. And so I saw my buddies going down. And I, so I said, yeah, I'm going back, getting that hole. Well, I'd just been probably 10 or 15 feet past, so I ran back and I jumped in that artillery hole. And um, that stayed there. So uh, that was probably, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 o'clock in the morning. And I had a bad habit of smoking. Well, I think this happened. I, I can't prove it. But I went for my cigarettes, and I got a cigarette, and I got a match. And the matches that we had, or that I, I found in a house, had a lot of sulfur. So I lit that and a puff of smoke went up. Well, I got the cigarette lit, but it wasn't long after that, man, here comes a mortar shell in front of my artil or mortar or artillery hole and it pushed the dirt a little bit. Thank God it didn't go off because it was probably 10 feet ahead of me. If it had gone off, she'd have, she'd have got me. Well, thank God it didn't. Maybe some of the Polish prisoners or whoever made their mortar shells made it a dub, made it a dud. So then that happened, and then one came and backed me a mortar shell. So I knew what they, I know what they do. I, I'd had training in mortar shell. They put one in front of you, they put one in back of you. Uh-oh, I heard a third one coming in. Oh. And I didn't know what the hell to do, really. But in a way, I guess I was lucky. It, it went off about 15, 20 feet away from me. And a piece of shrimp was about the size of the first joint of my little finger. Went through all my winter clothing, my big heavy overcoat, and jacket, and sweater, and underwear, and all that. Went through there. And, went in and uh, broke two or three ribs and hit my lung and went under my spine and lodged over on my right side. Gosh, I'm lucky I'm here. Oh, you are so lucky. Yeah, so I don't know what I th thought of, but I did. I, uh, I lift this arm up and it sounds just like a flat tire. Just the air rushing out of there mm -hmm. to get out. Well, I put that arm back there quick, and I got my eight sulfa pills. That's what we took if we got wounded, eight sulfa pills. I got my sulfa pills, put them in my mouth, and got my canteen, because you're supposed to drink a lot of water with sulfa, because it's bad on the kidneys, I guess. So I drank my sulfa, and then um, I said, well, I guess I've done everything I can do. I'm either going to live or I'm going to die. So another crazy thing I did, I didn't know why I did this, but I'll tell you. I um, I thought perhaps I'd be bleeding inside. 
bleeding to death and drowning myself in blood. Mm -hmm. So I took my steel helmet off and I ran my rifle bayonet down the ground and put my steel helmet up on top of my, my uh, rifle, hoping that either maybe a German, German medic or an American medic would see me and come and give me a shot of um, oh, morphine. Morphine. Now, Thank was you. was that something that you were trained to do if you were wounded to to do that? No. Okay. I just did it. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but I did. Mm -hmm. I had to get attention. Mm -hmm. I felt because I I suppose I could have crawled, but I didn't think of it. Mm -hmm. So then, what happened? Um. So, um. That must have happened. It was a oh, cloudy, rainy day. Bad day. And the, um, so I was wounded there. And uh, our first platoon in our tank battalion, 750, I think it was, tank battalion, they were, they were coming in to uh, try to find out or shoot or knock down these Germans that are in that village because there's mm -hmm. a lot of bushes, uh, young shrubs out in front, mm -hmm. like the peripheral part, in front of the, the village. It was well guarded, well, well not guarded, but well protected, camouflaged. And um, so um, these tanks start going down. Because I think they thought there was a tiger tank in that village too. Because mm. he he shot, blew my uh, first lieutenant to pieces. I saw that. It's, they always say that tanks won't shoot one person, but don't believe it. Um, so I saw a buddy of mine uh, who had taken medical training with me on one of these tanks, and I hollered at him. I said, I've been hit. I need help. He said, okay, I'll be back. He says, I got, got to go with these tanks down here. We've got to uh, knock out a machine gun nest or do something down in there. So probably about a half hour or an hour later, he came back, and he mm -hmm. crawled over my foxhole, cut my all my clothes off, and gave me a shot of morphine. And... Uh, he said, uh, Mr. Axley, or Jerry, I think he called us, you just stay there when it gets dark or dust. I'll come come and get you with a, with a jeep. So, by gosh, when it got dark, they knew where I was. They came down with a stretcher, pallbearers, or not pallbearers, stretcher carriers, and put me on that jeep because they put the windshield down and mm -hmm. they could put the, uh, they could put the, um, stretcher right across that. Mm -hmm. Took me back to company headquarters and I stayed there probably about an hour, an hour and a half and then um, they got a load of uh, wounded soldiers and loaded us up on the uh, uh, ambulances. I think they could take six or eight, I can't remember now. But I was, I was on the bottom, I know that. and. Uh, they took us back to uh, Liège, Belgium, L-I-E-G-E, -E, Belgium. That was a field, what they call a field hospital. Mm -hmm. How and far was that? I would think 15, 20 miles, mm -hmm. Liège. Uh, they would made a hospital out of a, uh, um, a school, academy. Mm -hmm. They, they, they did a, converted that academy into a, a hospital. For uh, take care of the wounded, mm -hmm. so that's what uh, that's what happened to me. And then, how long before you, you got medical attention oh, once okay. you arrived there? Okay, um, <clears throat> I got back to Liège, and they a doctor, I think his name was Black, I can't remember, and. Uh, he, he went in there and got that piece of shrapnel out and uh, they gave it to me and I had it on my stand in the hospital but 
One day, I think a German orderly knocked it off and swept it up and mm. I lost it. Mm. So all I can tell you is how big it was and it was about that big and real jaggered. It was carry a lot of germs, that's for sure. If you didn't take your pig. So, um, okay. Um, I, uh, okay. Would you like to stop now and continue another day, or would you like to continue now and go on for another hour? Oh, well, I'm here, I think, get her done. Okay. Would you like to take a break? Would you like to use the restroom or anything before we start again? No. Okay. Do you? No, thank you. You're all right? Mm -hmm. How about you, Mr. Lucia's son or our grandson? He was in the Marines also, hmm. and he, he fought in Iraq, hmm. and he's back. Uh, we're, uh, you got to count your blessings. Mm -hmm. You've got to count your blessings. You know, you can always look uh, on bad things, but you got to be as optimistic as you possibly can. And I'm very fortunate to be able to come and talk and put on a little show or whatever it is, I hope. Well, thank you It'll very, help somebody. very much for being with us today. We I'm good. very much appreciate it. I appreciate your patience and your patience. God bless you all. Thank you. You're doing a good job. We don't know how much it'll help, but it may help somebody. Who knows? Just pray to God it may help somebody. Amen. This is the second tape of a session uh, interviewing Gerald Thomas Yaxley who uh, fought with the 104th Infantry Division in Europe. And this interview is for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Today is September 11th, 2007, and we are in the studio of WILL on the campus of the University of Illinois in Urbana, Illinois. My name is Harriet Williamson, and also uh, in the studio is Henry Radcliffe, who is the sound, light, and recording engineer for this session. And when we stopped, you had been telling us about being wounded and being in the hospital in Liege. Do you want to say anything more about that experience? Yeah. Okay. Are we ready? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> I think I told you that I'd been operated on by Dr. Black and had a piece of shrapnel about so large. And uh, he extracted it. And I um, I was at Liège, I think probably a week, and then I was shipped to um, Paris, Paris, uh, France, in one of their hospitals, run mostly by nuns, Catholic hospital, and they took wonderful care of us. So I was there, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I was there until my, um, after my 21st birthday. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they flew, flew us, several of us, flew us over to um, near Malmesbury, England, which is near Bristol, England. So I was there for about, uh, I don't know, I would say at least a month, two months, where they taught us how to kind of breathe with one lung and not use the other one as much. So rehabilitation mm -hmm. and um, I was there I can't remember how long I was there month six weeks at least then I was shipped back across the English Channel over to um, France and uh, was uh, sent to join up with the uh, 24th smoke generating battalion um, where I drove a jeep um, after that, let me see. What does this, what does that mean, a smoke generating battalion? Oh, okay. What's the purpose of that? Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. Good question. Um, 
they had mortars. Now, I don't know if you know what a mortar is. Do you know what a mortar is? Well, I, why don't you tell me about it? Okay. I, I have a, a mortar idea. is a, uh, they call them stovepipes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're so long and they have a base and then they have a uh, tripod and then they have the uh, stovepipe, which is made out of iron. It's strong. And um, they, and their, their diameter is probably what, four and a half inches, could be four and a half inches. Mm -hmm. And they have these shells, you know, many kinds of shells. I don't know, uh, phosphorus and, and uh, different poisonous gases too. Mm -hmm. They can have on these shells. And they, you know, well, primarily you asked what smoke, I mean, they did have some that just uh, would, uh, I don't know what they burned, but it would just give off a lot of smoke. So they would, they would shoot these shells up into the, close to the enemy, and so that the, uh, our soldiers could come forward and the smoke would be blinding the enemy. Mm -hmm. So that's why they call them smoke generators. They lay down a layer of smoke when they're going to uh, cross an open field mm -hmm. uh, to um, uh, to protect the oncoming uh, offensive. Mm -hmm. So I never I never did see that. To be honest with you, mm -hmm. of course I was only in combat 28 days. Mm -hmm. See, that's not very long. I've had, I got buddies that were in combat 185 days. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Mm -hmm. How do you know who's going to live and or who's going to get wounded? Or, I mean, in the infantry, you get about three or four options. You get killed, you get captured, you get wounded, or if you're lucky, you go all the way through. And I still go. I didn't go this year to the, um, I think the 61st or 62nd reunion of the 104th Timberwolf Division, because mm -hmm. I'm going to go to the, um, I'm going to go to the 60th reunion of the 4th Mechanized Cavalry mm -hmm. in um, South Dakota. Did I tell you what it was? Grand, Ooh. Grand Rapids? No, S Rapid City. Yeah, rap, well, that's that's where the airplane lands, but the um, it's north of that. Is it on a base? No, okay. it's a <laughs> it's a motel mm -hmm. <laughs> where the well, there's only twelve or fifteen uh, that are able. See there, I'm eighty three, be eighty four in December, and a lot of those guys are in their late 80s, 88, 90, see there. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're losing a lot of Second War um, vets. Mm -hmm. We're dying off pretty fast. I think about 1,500 a day. So taxpayers are saving a little money. The quicker we die, the less taxes. <laughs> pension, because I get a pension, 20% <laughs> pension, which isn't much, about oh, $200 a month pension. Mm -hmm. But it's something. I'm thankful. Buy his groceries for a week. <laughs> okay, now where was I? Wait, you were um, now. Had you returned to to the the Timberwolf Division? No, I never did go back. Okay. So, no. what division were you with then when you returned? I was with the 24th Smoke Generating Battalion. That's right. You said that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that. And you were driving a jeep. I beg your pardon. You were driving a jeep. Yes. I was a T5, technician fifth class. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? That Technician means I could start, shift gears, and run a Jeep, mm -hmm. <laughs> primarily. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'd been a PFC when I was in combat. I'd made one grade, because mm -hmm. private's the lowest, PFC's the next, and then T5 or technician fifth grade is, well, you know, <clears throat> I don't know. Now you didn't see further combat 
but you continued in Europe. Service. Right. And what, what what country were you in then when you returned? France. France. Right. Okay. Epernay. Okay. You know about Epernay? No, I don't. It's a um, it's a small city, but it's um, the ground under the city or not built. It's not a city. It's a village. It's all uh, excavated. It's the Champagne Center of the world. That's where they, they dug all this out, and uh, they got wine down there for mm, well, I don't know about miles, but long way. They, mm -hmm. And they uh, they sell off so many linear feet of of uh, tunnel to the wine growers, and and that, and in these in these uh, runways or cellars, they have a lot of these. Um, wooden things where they put the wine because they got to they got to turn them mm -hmm. every so often mm -hmm. I don't know what for is a reason I'm not a wine wine maker so I don't know okay now where shall we go do you want to talk about what you continue doing then while you were in Europe I just drove a jeep for mm -hmm. a captain who was uh, associated with the 24th Smoot General Battalion and it was after the war, and uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize the war had ended. Yeah, the, the war, war had ended, ended. Uh, VE Day, mm -hmm. May eighth. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was. Now, now you're in occupied peacetime France. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. I don't. I don't know if you'd call it well. Yeah. Occupied means to me you were the enemy at one spot of time, and now you're occupied by the conquerors. I don't know. Because France, well, France was conquered by the Germans, right. but we were the liberators, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, side, side, <laughs> side issue, I took three years of French in high school, but I learned more French from the French girls than I had a chance to <laughs> meet after the war <laughs> than I did in the three years of high school French. <laughs> you were going to tell me about your rifle. Oh, yes. Okay. My M1, M16, excuse me, is an O30 rifle, 30 caliber. Mm -hmm. um, the second day of combat, my buddy got hit by a sniper, and uh, he hit, they took him back. Well, that day, we got pinned down by the Germans. They pinned us down with uh, machine guns and snipers. We were down on the ground. Um, and we'd called RAS, Lieutenant, he'd called for help because we, we couldn't move without getting hit. Either the snipers would get us or the machine gunners or the mortars or the 20 millimeter guys somebody in the woods there was a wooded area ahead of us so they would pick us off so he called for light tanks to come up and shoot them out of there so here comes a tank and he gets up I'm, I'm, I'm on the ground calling I got my rifle up there and he gets up close to me and he just pivots that tank well he ran right over my rifle my rifle was right here, and he just pivots, English, it was English tank, pivots, and he ran over my rifle, and I and he tore off my my pack, too. And in that pack was a phosphor shell <gasps> that they shoot uh, in mortars. Oh, my goodness. You know, phosphor shells, you've probably seen pictures of phosphor shells. They hit, and then it's fire all over. It just shoots fire all over. Uh, thank God it didn't go off. I wouldn't be here today. Um, so that tank, he, he, he got, so that was about 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So about dusk, about 5 o'clock, 5.30, uh, we made a charge. And my buddy, I knew her, where he was, so I ran over and got his rifle. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Because I had shells in my, uh, uh -huh. my belt. I had shells. It would fit his rifle because he had an M16 also. So that was the end of that rifle. 
tossed into that rifle. <laughs> um, my poor rifle. How did you keep in touch with people back home while you were in Europe? Didn't. Didn't. How could you? Didn't have any mail. Mm -hmm. Didn't have any mail. I think it took, um, like I got hit on the 22nd of November. I don't think my folks learned from the State Department that I was mooted for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, then they got the, uh, they got the little telegram and mm -hmm. where they tear out the phrases and tape them to the telegram. And yeah. And my wife, she was here. Yep. And th they sent her a copy, too. Oh my goodness. She was here and uh, was living at Welch House on mm -hmm. Nevada Street. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, were you, I'm sorry, were you married then before no, you? No, no, okay. no. Okay. Engage, well, mm -hmm. kind You're of engaged. Mm -hmm. Well, here I am leaning forward. I'm sorry. And um, my wife, well, she was fiancé, I guess. No, I wasn't engaged. Well, I gave her a. A, a ring, mm -hmm. you know, like so you I love almost, you, and I you were want you to marry me. But mm -hmm. this is a war, man. We better not wait till after what we're going with, because mm. I don't know which way is the best. But we thought that would be the best way to go. No, so they weren't able then to communicate with you at any point while you were gone. My folks, and my mm -hmm. wife, mm -hmm. and my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. No, mm. that must have never been very, got any mail. That must have been very, very hard on them. Oh, yes. As well as you. Oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, did, that's true. Did that keep your spirits low to not have that communication? or? No, not necessarily, because I was with other guys that mm -hmm. same thing. You same know. thing. Mm -hmm. I don't feel sorry for myself. <laughs> I'm not that type of person. Is there anything else you would like to talk about in terms of your experiences in e either in combat or being in Europe? or any of memorable people that you would like to talk about? Well, I think in summary, I would just like to say that uh, nobody wins a war. Both sides lose, because you lose men and ladies. So um, I wish the top Presidents, prime ministers, whatever they are of their countries, could get together and negotiate, and there must be a way out. And words are much, they're safer. Words are much safer than bullets or shells. And if they're intelligent, because they're a head of state, they should be able to negotiate and come to some, come to some agreement where mankind can live together. I know we got a long way to go. Uh, civilization, we're not civilized. We're still fighters. And we Americans are, we do fight a lot. Because I think we, I heard somebody say yesterday, we've been in 12 conflicts in the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. That's not good. But I don't know what you do. Hope people become more patient and uh, we'll sit and talk. If it takes a week or a month to negotiate, it will take a day or a week or a month. Mm -hmm. But there must be a way out because war is no good. War, it's a little three-letter word, but it's no good for humanity. Because usually it's the, uh, I don't know if this is true or not, but I'm going to say it. I think it's the lower class or the lower or the people that perhaps are not educated as well as other people are, are the peons. They do the fighting. They, mm -hmm. They're the ones that are, are getting killed, and that shouldn't be right. Mm -hmm. if, if we're going to go to war, then... Everybody goes. Nobody is better than anybody else. We're human beings. Mm -hmm. Women want to fight, let them fight. Mm -hmm. 
They don't want to fight. Men, that's boys and men, uh, don't think they should fight. I don't know. It's up to the woman. It's her life. It's her country. It's her philosophy. It's her belief. If she wants to fight, let her fight. If she doesn't, you know, I, I would let her do what she wants. But I know war is still probably, for men, it shouldn't be. I just hope, I hope my kids will learn to uh, negotiate and uh, not fight. Because there's got to be a way out. If if you if you can uh, if you can come to some understanding today, well maybe tomorrow you can come to a, a, a bigger understanding. Mm -hmm. I hope because we all love life. Life is well, there's ups and downs. I realize that, but uh, we need each other. We need each other. I don't care what race you are, what creed you are, what what you are. Uh, human beings need human beings, and animals need animals, and let the world be peaceful. Amen. Did I? Are we off or on? We're still on. We're, We're still on. Mm -hmm. I um, forgot. I know I can't think of everything. I try, but I can't. Even though I write things down, like a uh, grocery list, <laughs> I still forget. I uh, I'm a member of the World War II in Washington D.C. Long time ago, I filled out some stuff and gave them permission to do something. But I'm a member of of some World War II in in Washington. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know about that or no, not. No, I don't. Mm -hmm. Which would be something similar to this, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Instead of was this a, was it in an interview that you did? Mm, no, I didn't do an interview. Mm -hmm. I just wrote, I just wrote a little bit about my so life was, in the service. Mm -hmm. I think. Do, did you want to talk at all about when you came back to the United States after the war was over? Yeah, good. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, I got wounded November 22nd, then, uh, 22nd, 1944, and then uh, I um, got rehabilitated mm -hmm. for my lung. And then um, I got back in the States on January... I believe it was the 6th of 1946. Mm -hmm. And my wife still loved me then, and I still loved her. So we got married um, May 20th, 1946. Mm -hmm. So we've been married 61 years, which isn't too bad. Because in marriage, there's hills and valleys. <laughs> Nothing's 100% smooth, which is all right. Um, okay, so then we had... Um, I was in 46. What, yeah. And did you go to school then when you returned? Yes, I got the GI Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. Yes, I got mm -hmm. the GI Bill of Rights, and I went, after we got married, uh, <laughs> we bought a trailer, an 18-foot trailer, and we lived in that, and uh, it was out in New York State. Uh, I went to Geneseo, mm -hmm. and uh, went through four years of college and three, because we went summers, everything. So then, um, after I got my bachelor's, I uh, I wanted to decide if I wanted to be a teacher. So I taught a year at a junior high school back in those days, not middle school, it was junior high. So I like I like teaching, um, but I didn't like losing my children every 53 minutes. I figured I was, I was selfish. I, I figured I'm the best person those kids will ever meet. I got uh, ambition, enthusiasm, um, intelligence. I want to help them learn to live and be happy and uh, get ahead in this world as best 
kid. And I thought I was the best teacher. I was selfish, I realize that, but if you don't like yourself, who do you like? <laughs> That's did, what I look at. Did the war influence your life then when you came home or in the future, either your training or your experience in the military? Well, I have nothing to compare it to. Mm -hmm. Was your health affected at all as a result of your wound? My hope? Your, your, your health? Health? No. Um, I'm 20% disability. Mm -hmm. But my lung uh, re recuperated or repaired itself real well mm -hmm. because I played sports. And... Uh, No, I did, well, I did, I did some physical work where I needed my lung more than metal, mm -hmm. but um, no, um, I had a good wife. That's half the battle right there. Mm -hmm. uh, a very understanding wife, but um, it has a lot of good precognition. She, she can read me. Pretty dang well. Scares me sometimes. <laughs> she knows what I'm thinking. <laughs> but it's all right, I guess. But um, I've had a good life. I've had a good life. Yeah. I was a Catholic for 30 years. I was a Presbyterian for five or six years because we decided we had four kids. And um, we thought we knew, my wife and I, uh, no church is a better church. They're all, their goals are all the same. They're trying to, uh, Ten Commandments, you know. So uh, I just wanted uh, my kids to have a good education. That's another reason why we moved here to the University of Illinois. <laughs> but would you believe only one of our children went to the University of Illinois? <laughs> we planned it that way, but it didn't work out. The other two got their, uh, two of our girls got their bachelor's in teaching down at Charleston and Bill my second son uh, he went to Parkland but then I lost him in 81 he was in the Marines and he came home on a furlough and um, he was out with some of his buddies drinking and driving three out of four of them got killed mm. yeah you never you never can um, live that down. A death of a child is just impossible. You, it's with you all the time. It just Maybe that's the way it should be. I don't know. But my wife uh, had a terrible time for the first year or two. I told her, I said, honey, you got to keep working. You stay at home, you're just going to worry and cry and be in grief and you won't make me a good wife and you won't be happy. So she did. She kept teaching at Parkland. Mm -hmm. And she taught over at Parkland for 30 years. And uh, that's the best way to go, I think. We miss Bill an awful lot. He did have a son. And uh, we do see his son or our grandson. He was in the Marines also. Mm -hmm. And he, he fought in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And he's back. Uh, or, uh, you got to count your blessings. Mm -hmm. You got to count your blessings. You know, you can always look uh, on bad things, but you got to be as optimistic as you possibly can. And I'm very fortunate to be able to come and talk, and put on a little show or whatever it is. I hope. Well, thank you. It will help somebody. Very much for being with us today. I'm we good. very much appreciate it. I appreciate it. it. Your patience and your patience. God bless you all. Thank you. You're doing a good job. We don't know how much it'll help, but it may help somebody. Who knows? But just pray to God it may help somebody. Amen. <laughs>